Hi everybody, welcome to Graduate Statistics, University of Cincinnati. This is our week 11. Last week you worked on your midterm exam. I hope that I delivered on my promise that the um, analysis part was going to be just a long um, independent activity, right? It should have um, felt to you that you were not doing anything unexpected or something you haven't seen before. The only additional challenge is that you had to select which test you were going to use. If you felt differently about the exam, please email me. I'd love to hear some feedback. And I really hope that uh, by having half the points be uh, as ascribed to the multiple choice question, I took off the load and the pressure a little bit in the analysis piece and gave you some opportunity to practice a little more with less skin, a little less skin on the game. Because really what I wanted, what I want the exam to be in addition to being an evaluative activity, that it is, it felt to you like one, one other opportunity to learn and explore and um, experience how it is to be a data analyst, right? Um, just having that experience and, and perhaps feeling a little confident that solidifying uh, what you've learned and feeling a little bit more empowered about what you have accomplished so far. Because it's hard to see that sometimes when you're in the, in going through the motions of every week's you know, material. Um, I now will move on to the next module, which is the chi-square module. And I will make a compact one because I think it deserves some rest. So I don't want you to do, don't want you to have to do two data analysis projects. So we'll just do the guided activity and there will be no independent activity to do this week. Okay. So you deserve a little, a little less pressure this week. And that's what we'll try to accomplish. All right. So let's get started. Chi-square. Let's start with a problem that requires this type of analysis. Jury selection. Random jury selection is an important aspect of criminal justice. One thing it is expected to accomplish is representativeness. If the selection process is not biased, then the composition of the jury should reflect the composition of the population. Take the issue of race, for instance. The presence of racial minorities on, jury, on a jury allows the group to understand and appreciate the different life experiences that different racial identities have with the criminal justice system. This leads the jury as a whole to perform their fact-finding tasks more effectively by helping eliminate or lessen individual biases or prejudices. In turn, trials are more likely to be considered fair and impartial, which is critical given that people of color are disproportionately policed and incarcerated. Civil rights groups have been fighting to guarantee racial representation in juries because they perceive we're not, as a society, doing a very good job of guaranteeing that. Is there evidence to back up their view? The question that we're trying to address here, is there evidence that the race distribution in the jury is different from the distribution of races in the population at large? This kind of question to be addressed empirically, meaning with data, a data-based answer to this question, um, would require help of a chi-square test. So this is why I'm using this problem as a backdrop to introduce you to this analysis. So let's, let's move on. So here's our question one more time with filling. Is there evidence that the race distribution in the jury is different from the distribution in the population at large. What's the data? So I tracked down some data from Lucas County, Ohio that I found publicly available. The source was the 1990 census data and um, looking at racial representativeness of juries uh, from the UC Census Bureau. So I found it online and here is the distribution of race in ethnicities of 3,878 3, people who served on juries during that period of time. 
This is the observed counts, okay? So we had 3,435 white folks injuries, 366 black individuals injuries, and 77 um, Hispanic individuals. Of course, we can't just look at these raw numbers and say, oh, look, we have less um, black individuals than white individuals because, you know, sorry. When we look at this table, we see that there is less black individuals and white individuals, but this alone does not allow us to say that there is a bias. A bias would be concluded, we can conclude bias only if the proportion of white, black, and Hispanic representation in juries is different from those proportions in the population right so that is the important piece because if we have if blacks black individuals and hispanic individuals are, are minorities in the population it is expected that there is less uh, individuals that are black or hispanic in the jury but it has to be the same proportion in the population for us to conclude that there is no bias in those selections so for us to determine that, we need to look at the distribution of ethnicities of the people in the county who were eligible for jury duty. So think about it. We have a pool of people, a bucket of people that can be selected, hopefully randomly, to participate in juries, all right? If they're pulled randomly from that bucket of available people, the proportions of white individuals, black and Hispanics, should be the same in the population or close to the same in the population and in the jury, right? So that's what chi-square will help us determine. If I'm sampling from the, randomly from the population of people available or eligible for jury duty, if I'm randomly sampling from that population, the distribution should look quite alike in terms of proportions. So there should be around 85.9% of white individuals, around 11.9% of black individuals, and around 2.2% of Hispanic individuals in the jury. But of course, because of sampling error, it will likely not be exact, even if there is no bias, it would not be exactly 85.9%, right? So we want to know, you know, if there are differences, are these differences large enough for us to conclude that they are unlikely or atypical? in the absence of some bias, okay? So let's keep going to clarify things. So is there evidence that the race distribution in the jury is different from the distribution in the population? So imagine that you are a data analyst who was hired to examine the available, um, the available data and determine whether there is statistical evidence of bias. Your proposition. Formulate the issue as a hypothesis test. So age zero, the no hypothesis, would be that people selected for jury duty are a simple random sample from the population of potential jurors. The observed counts of jurors from various race ethnicities follow the same ethnic distribution in the population. The alternative hypothesis is that something is going on. People selected for jury duty are not a simple random sample from the population of potential, potential jurors. The observed counts of jurors from various ethnicities do not follow the same race ethnicity distribution in the population. So how do we evaluate uh, the hypothesis? Step one, estimate how different the observed counts are from the expected counts um, considering you know the distribution of races in the population step two determine the likelihood that one would see the estimated difference between expected and observed counts if only chance was at play and to determine that uh, we need the chi-square test for good goodness of fit because those differences between expected and observed under conditions, under random conditions, under the null hypothesis, is distributed as chi-square. So we can use the chi-square distribution to compute the probability of finding a particular 
um, difference between expected and observed under the null hypothesis. So here is the chi-square distribution. Just like the t-distribution, it will look a little different depending on the number of degrees of freedom. This is the one for two degrees of freedom. This is the one for four degrees of freedom. This is the one for nine. So if you know if you find an expected difference here of 15, then the probability might be pretty small um, of observing that under the null hypothesis. So we tend to say, uh, maybe there's something going on, right? Just like you've done before. In a bit, I'll tell you how you get the degrees of freedom. But I just wanted you to have an overview of the steps and see the similarity actually from what we've seen before, right? So we, we, we compute a statistic that account, you know, that, that shows the difference that we are observing in our data. And then we compute the probability of observing that difference under the null hypothesis. It's just that the difference in expected and observed counts distributes as chi-square, has this funny distribution under the null hypothesis. If there's nothing going on, only chance going on, it should distribute like this. Okay. All right. So let's see how we uh, estimate how different the observed counts are from the expected counts. That's step one. So step 1a, let's calculate the expected number of jurors under the null hypothesis that the distribution in the juror, in, you know, in the juries is the same as the distribution in the population. So let's see, percent in the population, 85.9% white, 11.9% black, 2.2% Hispanic, and 100% is the total, right? The sum of all of that. So let's see what is the expected count. Uh, if we have 3,878 people that participated in juries, we can compute what is the expected number of white juries, black juries, and Hispanic juries if those were being randomly sampled from the population and no bias in selection exists? So let's do that. If I take the total and I multiply by the, the percentage, I get the number. So that if the distribution is approximately the same, then the expected number of white juries should have been, should be 3,000, 331. Of black juries, you know, you have the total here, we multiply by the percentage, and then we get, uh, for the, the proportion eh, in this case, um, and we get the uh, number, the expected number of 462. And for Hispanic, again, we do the same calculation, except we use the proportion of expected Hispanic, if no bias existed. So that would be 85. Now, you know, the sum of all of that is the same 300, 3,878 3, jurors. Now we need to quantify the deviation from the observed. So those are the expected under the null hypothesis. Those are the actual observations. If we look here, we have more white juries than would be expected under the null hypothesis, under the hypothesis of no bias. We have less black juries than what would be expected under the null hypothesis. And we have less Hispanic juries than would be expected under the null hypothesis. The key question is, the descriptive statistics already tells us that. The key question is, are the sum of these deviations here, the total deviation, large enough for us to say that it, they are unlikely under the null hypothesis, right? Just as before. The descriptive statistics cannot tell us that because we would not, even if there was no bias, we would not expect to see exactly this number here, exactly 3,331. There could be some variation expected just by chance. So the role of a statistical test, in this case, the chi-square test, is to determine if the deviations are large enough. So we need to quantify that deviation. So again, we can see the direction of the bias by looking at this table, but we need to see if that's large enough. And the way we compute this is we get the observed minus the expected. We square it so we don't have negative and positive values. So we just get the kind of 
only positive deviations, and we divide by the expected. Now, why we divide by the expected? You can imagine that a deviation of 10 when the expected is 100 is proportionally more important than when we have a deviation of 10, but the expected is 1,000, right? In proportion, you want to normalize this. That's why we divide by the expected. We want the deviation in proportion of what it is that is expected, okay? And we do that for, we compute that, diff, that square difference and divide by the expected for each one of the categories, okay? And then we sum, so we have the sum of the squared deviations in proportion of the expected counts, and that gives us a chi-square statistic that we can then compute the probability of. So again, why do we square the deviations? Because then we just get positive standardized differences. And just like when we compute the, just like I, I told you when we were computing um, standard deviation, when we square those differences, we increase the, the weight of large deviations and we penalize less small deviations, which is important because small deviations could be just random chance, it's just the larger deviations that you want to count more. And squaring those deviations accomplish just that. Same as we saw for um, the standard deviation. We'll come back for step two on the next video. See you then.